When most people think of a badger, they imagine a shy, solitary animal living in the countryside and keeping itself very much to itself. But as we'll see in this film, some badgers live in the towns. They're very sociable beasts and they're anything but shy. What a nice big fat boy you're getting ready for the winter, aren't you? Eh? And Sophie. I want you to go and fetch the babies in now. Like a good little badgers. Right? You're an overgrown ferret. I feed these badgers every night. And I have done so for several years now. I talk to them, they're quite friendly with me. Um, tell them lots of little secrets, which they don't blab on to other people. Very useful having badges to tell secrets to. Of the many badgers that are fed regularly by people, this group Faye Burton watches in Staffordshire is exceptional. They have such a complete trust in her that when she whistles, they come out of their set, even in broad daylight. In Wrexham, Mr. Williams' relationship with town badgers started on his doorstep. We happened to be watching television and we looked out to the window and there uh, there was a badger on the scene and then we started feeding them didn't we mm. well they got a bit greedy then they seemed to come to the back door and started knocking at the back door didn't they this blonde badger turned up on the scene and you know with it being a different color from the rest i thought well i can believe our eyes at first this pale animal is not an albino but an erythristic badger it's a rare colour variety in which the black markings have been replaced by red. More than one pale badger showed up at the Williams house. This one has been visiting for 11 years. That's just about as old as a wild badger gets and proves that being pale is no disadvantage to survival. In towns, badgers still dig large underground networks of holes. These sets may be decades, even centuries old, and the older they are, the bigger they get. But unlike foxes, which moved into the towns, badger sets were here long before bricks and mortar were in sight. For it's bricks and mortar that have spelt doom for many a badger's home. Their traditional sets have been slowly encircled by development, leaving the animals isolated, stranded in a sea of houses, and for these badgers, there is no escape. This set near Reading was the subject of a vigorous campaign fought between developers and the local residents led by Mrs. Shirley Davis. I started to get rather angry and I made up my mind that there was absolutely no way that I was going to let these badgers die. They came every evening to see me. I couldn't betray them. There is no way I could have betrayed those badgers and allowed them to die. Eventually, Shirley Davis and the other protesters forced the developers into a solution. The badger set would be totally enclosed on all sides by a fence. A flap in the metal door would be the badger's way out. Leading from the enclosure, a narrow, fenced alleyway would provide a secure path for the badgers to new foraging grounds. But despite this minor triumph, 
Shirley feels it's necessary to carry water and bedding to the set every day until, she hopes, the badgers get used to being surrounded by a housing estate. What really worries me is the fact that now they are surrounded completely by the houses. If the people in those houses uh, aren't sympathetic towards badgers, then the badgers will have no foraging whatsoever. If they get into their gardens, the people aren't going to be sympathetic. Shirley has good reason to be worried. The future for these badgers looks pretty grim. But here is one success story. A pocket of woodland surrounded by the town and housing developments. And in it, one of the largest known groups of badgers in Britain. There must be at least 30 badgers here, and I've been filming them on and off for the past year or so. One man, though, has spent the past 30 years studying these animals intensively, and that's local resident Don Hunford. Don can identify these badgers as individuals. He recognizes them by their marks, by their size, their shape, sometimes just their personalities. By recognizing and naming each animal, Don has been able to gather a mass of information about the behavior of his badgers. They, and indeed all badgers, live in family groups, usually several generations in the same set. They spend the first part of each evening together. During this time, they play, groom, and reinforce the family bond by scent marking each other. A musky smell is produced by a gland at the base of the tail, and every group has its own unique odor. These musking sessions often involve lots of animals. Relationships within the group are also made stronger by the animals regularly grooming each other. This may also help reduce the numbers of fleas and lice. There's often sexual activity around the set from spring right through to late summer, but successful matings usually take place between dominant animals. Each badger, in fact, has a well-defined social status within the group. This is established and maintained by bouts of play fighting. It may look vicious, but this is no more than rough play between a youngster and an adult. This island of woodland in the middle of urban Essex belongs to Don Hunford. It's safe from the encroaching tide of development, for now at least. Elsewhere, the summer rain brings a tasty badger snack to the surface. Badgers are true omnivores, eating everything from worms and insect larvae to windfall plums. Badgers can climb trees, but this animal, shinning five meters up a vertical trunk to reach a woodland bird table, is remarkable. The only way down is a sort of controlled slide.
flower bulbs in greenhouses, carrots in vegetable patches, the badgers quietly exploit the town's many food sources. But not without some antagonism from other residents. Oh dear, look, those wretched badgers have been at my carrots again. What point is there in me buying seed it's in put, and working hard to, to, to try to grow some food for the winter and then the badgers come and destroy the lot? They even dig up my tulip bulbs. They've had my strawberries for the second year running. It's really disheartening. I've put directly barbed wire all around the edge of the garden. I've done the best I can to keep them out. In parts of the garden, along the hedge, I've got netting wire, but it's absolutely hopeless. They still come in. They're ruining and destroying everything, and I'd like to shoot the lot of them. Undoubtedly, the town badger can cause damage, but it's not deliberate vandalism. This fence was built by a householder across a badger's regular pathway. It simply used its great strength to drive through. And the badger's strength is useful for getting to another source of food. The householder recognizes the culprit, but how many others blame foxes who, in reality, wouldn't be able to pull a full dustbin over? The dustbin contents represent a useful supplement to the badger's diet, especially in winter. Snow lies thick around the Essex set, where earlier I'd filmed Don Hunford's badgers at play. It's a common belief that badgers hibernate. In fact, they're active throughout the cold weather. But because food is scarce, they live off their ample fat reserves laid down in the autumn. Now, Towards the end of winter, deep below ground, the newborn cubs have yet to open their eyes. Cubs stay below ground until they're 12 weeks old. They grow very quickly, and soon they're difficult to tell apart from the adults. But they can still be recognized by their powder puff tails. Banger, Northern Ireland, and an unusual encounter between town badgers and local resident Mr. Barclay.
It's remarkable that these badgers are coming out in broad daylight, but the fact that they regularly leave the set to feed in the middle of suburbia whilst it's still light is extremely rare. Although most town badgers live in ancient sets, sometimes they build new ones in most unlikely places, under roads, sheds, summer houses, even under our own houses in the cellar or in the foundations. In this disused classroom at a school in Bristol, a small group of badgers arrived four years ago, and they established a set just a few inches beneath me, under these floorboards. Down here, it's warm, dry and secure. Because it's dark, they'll come up and play throughout the day. But like all badgers, it's not until nightfall that they become most active. Despite all their security, they were extremely nervous as they emerged. The most difficult group of badgers I had to film. During their nightly wanderings from garden to garden, badgers frequently stop to mark their territories. They do this by depositing dung and urine in shallow pits. The latrines act as a smelly warning for strange badgers to keep out. They keep to regular pathways which crisscross many gardens. Even though their route is well defined, their movements seem quite haphazard. Over one ten-minute period, we recorded all this activity. Badger gate I designed for my own garden. Um, it's entirely rabbit proof because I put a restrictor on here. Uh, a badger with his strength can easily push through that, but a rabbit can't. And it's been absolutely foolproof and I've never had any rabbits through there yet. Badgers, no problem. In North Essex, Don Bradnam cleverly made the most of the badgers that passed through his garden. I've been fascinated with badgers for over 50 years and I watched them at all hours. And when we came here 23 years ago, I decided that's enough of badger watching, going out in the woods and all that sort of thing in the dark and cold. And uh, I thought, they can come to me now. So I dug an artificial set out in the garden. And uh, I got a two-way switch in the set entrance, which I've connected by a cable, right across to this recorder here. This little gadget makes pinpoint punctures above the line for when they go into the set, below the line when they come out. Don has mastered the art of comfortable badger watching. He sits in an easy chair and waits for the badgers to arrive. They enter the artificial set and proceed along a complex system of tunnels to the feeding chamber where Don can also watch them. The badgers probably believe they're below ground, whereas, in fact, the chamber is raised three feet up for easy viewing. Here, literally only inches away, Don can observe them eating and sleeping blissfully unaware of any human presence. Unwittingly or otherwise, man is still responsible for the majority of badger deaths. When the Hastings to Tunbridge railway was electrified in 1986, at least a hundred badgers were killed in one fortnight. Most people only see a badger lying dead on the road, the ultimate fate for most urban badgers. But man has done his bit to come up with solutions. Gaps have now been put into some electrified lines, especially for badgers. On the roads, badger tunnels have been built under motorways or, as here, slung beneath a footbridge over a major road. 
on side roads, these reflectors are meant to dazzle badgers and stop them crossing. But it's doubtful if any of these measures make a difference to the number of badger deaths. Back in Essex, roads also represent a hazard for the numerous badgers at Don Hunford's set. There are probably so many badgers in this group because people have been feeding them. The main set is in those trees behind me. But Don doesn't feed them all through the night. Urban badgers will sometimes cover quite large distances, several kilometers even, in search of food. And these are no exception. They travel all the way down this alley to feed in the gardens of some of these houses where a meal is prepared for them every night. But to get to these gardens, they have to cross this road. Don's badgers may be wary of traffic, but their road sense is pretty poor. They cross at a gallop and hope for the best. A hundred yards away, Harry Slater has spent the past one and a half hours preparing the night's food. Half a pound of chocolate buttons, over two pounds of biscuits, 50 cakes, five and a half pounds of peanuts. In fact, a total weight of over 15 pounds of food for the badgers every night. Dinner is served. On the patio to begin with, then proceeding by easy stages to the front doorstep and then the hall. And for those with a more adventurous spirit, there's the television lounge. This process of gradual enticement has been going on at the Slaters for almost 30 years. These are the very same animals I filmed back at their woodland set on the other side of the road. Such unusually large groups of town badgers only survive as long as people, like the Slaters, continue to feed them. Come on then. You're going to snatch it now. Come on. You're going to snatch. Spike. Come on. There. Come on, Spike. Come on. Come on. Come on, then. Three wild badgers in the lounge isn't unusual for the Slaters, but on rare occasions they have had up to 16 in the house, 11 or more in the lounge alone. And outside, over 24 have come at any one time to feed on the patio. Deep in the heart of suburban Hastings, an encounter between man and wild animal is about to be recorded for posterity. A trough full of peanuts. A string leading to an elaborate system of pulleys and wires and levers. Enter stage left, the object for all this attention. Now, the theory is that to get to the peanuts, the badger will push the string off the nail with its nose which will, in turn, activate the complex mechanism. The photograph is taken, and the inventor of the device, Chaz Broadhurst, also manages to make a guest appearance. Although badgers are legally protected, it's still relatively easy to get planning permission to destroy their sets, for it's the animal which enjoys the full sanction of the law 
rather than its home. The fact that badgers still survive in our cities is a testament to their tenacity. wild badgers in the city are not like foxes. They can't adapt easily to change. They have to have their traditional sets and they have to have large areas to forage in. As man slowly nibbles away at the badger's territory, he's squeezing them out of existence. So it seems inevitable that fewer and fewer people in the 21st century will have the joy of seeing a wild badger in their back garden. <laughs>